Hey, I'm Justin from Alcatree, and in this video, I'm gonna walk you through creating your first FPGA projects. Before we jump into things, let me first start by directing you to our previous video, going over the basics of digital logic and what an FPGA is. If you haven't watched that video yet, I'd recommend clicking here to watch it now. I'm also going to assume that you've installed the necessary software for your FPGA board. For both the Alcatree AU and CU, you will need to have installed Alcatree Labs. For the CU, you will also need to install IceQ2 from Lattice, and for the AU, you will need to install Vivado from Xilinx. Installing the software can be a bit involved, so we've written tutorials that can guide you through the process. Links are in the video description. During the video, I'll be using the Alcatree AU. However, everything is directly relatable to the CU, and I'll point out anytime something would be different. The first step to any project is opening Alcatree Labs. From here, you can go to Project, New Project to open the New Project dialog. In this dialog, you can set up a new project by specifying the project's name, the folder, aka workspace, to save it to, the board you are using, the main language of the project, and the example project you want to base it off of. For our first project, I'm going to name it button to led and the default workspace is fine for me. I'm using the Alcatree AU, the language is Lucid, and the starting point is set to base project. Clicking create will create and open the project. On the left-hand side, you can expand the sources branch to find the single source file in our project. This will be either autop.luc or cutop.luc, depending on your board. Double click on this to open it. This file will always be the top file for your design. The top file contains the module whose inputs and outputs correspond to actual inputs and outputs on the FPGA. If you have done any programming before, this is sort of like your main function. As your project gets more complicated, you can break it down into modules. Your top level module can have submodules, and each of those can have their own submodules, and so on. Let's take a look at the contents of our top module. The first line has the module keyword followed by the name of the module. Following this is a list of the input and outputs of the module. You can see we already have some predefined ones to use, including the clock, reset button, LEDs, and the serial lines for the USB port. Following the port declarations, typically you will find any signal or constant declarations. Here we have a signal declaration for a single bit signal named RST for reset. Under this, we have a submodule instantiation for a module named Reset Conditioner. In this first demo project, we aren't going to be using the reset button as a reset, and we can remove these first handful of lines. You may have also noticed removing these lines causes lines 10 and 11 to turn red. Alcatree Labs performs real-time error checking on Lucid code. If you hover your cursor over these, it'll tell you the error. In this case, it's complaining because the module reset cond is no longer defined. We can simply remove these two lines. Our module is now drastically simplified. The next part is called an always block. Always blocks are a way to group a set of logical statements together. They have a certain set of rules that the tools use to figure out the type of behavior you are looking for and use that to create a circuit that matches that behavior. I'll explain these rules in more detail in a little bit, but before getting too complicated, let's just look at what's inside. The first line is the one we really care about. It is simply assigning the value of zero to the LEDs. This turns the LEDs off. The value here has a special notation. The first number is the number of bits in the constant, and the letter is the radix. The following numbers are the value itself. In this case, the value is 8 bits wide and in hexadecimal. The value itself is zero. Lucid supports H for X, B for binary, and D for decimal. The bit width number is optional, and if unspecified, the number of bits is implied and follows a certain set of rules. For hex numbers, the rule is four bits per digit. For binary, it's simply one bit per digit. And for decimal, it's the minimum number of bits to represent the specified value. For example, H00 is exactly the same thing as 8H00, which is the same thing as B followed by eight zeros. However, D0, D00, and D000 are all just one bit wide since you only need a minimum of one bit to represent zero. D10, on the other hand, is 4 bits wide, since 10 in binary is 1010. Zero, zero. If you specify the number of bits and it is larger than the specified value, the extra bits will be padded with the value of 0 or x depending on the most significant bit of the specified value. A value of x simply means don't care, and it is a way of telling the tools that you want to assign a value, but that you don't care if it's a 0 or a 1. This gives the tools some freedom to optimize your design instead of forcing it to use some arbitrary value when you don't care. Note that the value of X doesn't actually exist in hardware and it will be replaced by a one or zero. With the automatic padding, we could have written the value as 8H0, 8B0, or even 8D0 since they're all the same. If you don't specify a radix, decimal is assumed, 
and the bit width is set to the minimum possible value. It's usually best to specify a width for clarity, but sometimes it's not necessary and it just gets in the way. The last meaningful line is connecting the USB RX signal to the USB TX signal. This will cause any data sent over the serial port to be directly looped back. We don't really care about this for our project, but USB TX needs a value and this is a reasonable default. All right, now our goal is to hook up the button on the board to an LED so that when we press the button, the LED turns on. We have an input named RST underscore N, which connects to the reset button on the board. We can use this input and connect it to the LEDs by replacing the zero constant with the signal name. As you can see from the comment and the underscore N notation, this is an active low signal. That means when the button isn't being pressed, it's a one, and when it is pressed, it's a zero. This is the opposite of what we want though. To fix this, we can add a tilde to the beginning of the signal name. This is a bitwise inversion. That means that every bit of RSTN will be flipped. Something to notice here is that LED is declared as an 8-bit array. This signal has a bit for each of the corresponding LEDs on the board. The reset input is only one bit wide. So what happens when we connect them together like this? The signal is simply padded so that the seven most significant bits are set to zero. However, since we are inverting the bits, the padded zeros will also be inverted and the seven unused LEDs will be turned on. To prevent this, we can write this using the concatenation operator. This format is great in this case to make it very obvious that we are only using the first LED. Note that building projects for FPGAs can take some time, even for the simplest projects. Once the project is built, you can load it onto the FPGA. If you have an AU, you will see two different down arrows in the toolbar. The hollow one will program the FPGA directly, but the FPGA will lose configuration once it loses power. The solid arrow is available for both the AU and the CU, and will program the flash memory on the board with the configuration. This is read when the board is powered on by the FPGA to keep your configuration between power cycles. You can now see that when I press the reset button, the first LED turns on. This might not seem like an impressive demo, and for the most part, you're right. If you've ever worked with a microprocessor like an Arduino, you may have done a similar kind of project. However, this project is fundamentally different in how it works. With a microprocessor, the processor is running in a loop in which it reads the state of the button press and then sets the output of the LED accordingly. This happens over and over again at some fixed interval. With the FPGA, this isn't happening. Instead, inside the FPGA, the button input goes through some logic to invert it and then is directly wired to the output. There is no cycle time for the input to be read and the output to be written. It's all just connected. It's the same as if you bought a discrete inverter and hooked up the button to the LED through it. What is great about this is that we don't have a finite amount of processing time that every task competes for. We can continue designing our circuit with components that will operate completely independently from the button to LED connection. With a processor, the more code you add to the loop, the slower its reaction time to the button presses will be. With an FPGA, it will always be nearly instant. This design consists entirely of combinational logic. Combinational logic is a type of digital circuit whose outputs are determined solely by the current inputs. In this case, if I tell you if the button is pressed or not, you can tell me if the LED will be on or not. There is no internal state and you don't need to know if the button was pressed three seconds ago to know what the LED is doing right now. Combinational logic is described in the always blocks and consists of things like assignments and if statements. The lines in an always block are interpreted sequentially. That means that lines that occur lower in an always block take precedence over previous lines. The lines themselves aren't actually executed in any sense of the word. Instead, the tools use this notion to allow us to describe our circuits easily. For example, we could have written the button to LED example with an if statement. Here we assign a value of zero to the LED, but then after it, assign a one if the reset input is zero. You can think of this block as always being interpreted. The LED signal is assigned a value of zero, but if the button input is zero, our if statement is valid, so it gets assigned a value of one. When the button is pressed, the assignment of zero is ignored since there is an assignment that occurs later in the always block. If we had another direct assignment before our first, it would be completely ignored and pointless. It can be easy for people who are used to programming to get lulled into old habits due to the sequential feel of always blocks. It's important to have some idea how the circuit you're describing could be implemented to make sure you aren't describing something unreasonably complex when a slightly different description would make it very simple to implement in hardware. We are now going to move on to a more full featured example to introduce sequential logic. First, we need to create a new project. Do this the same way as before. I'm going to name mine Blinker. In this project, we're going to blink an LED. This may seem super trivial as well at first, but the important concept here is how do you keep track of time? In our previous example, there is no sense of time. The LED turns on immediately when the button is pressed. To have any idea of time, we need to have some kind of signal that repeats at a known interval. This is called a clock. 
The Alcatree boards have a 100 megahertz clock on them, and this provides the FPGA with 100 million pulses a second. To use the clock, we will be using a circuit element known as a D-type flip-flop, or DFF for short. Flip-flops are a type of memory and will hold a certain value between the edges of a clock. When the clock rises, the value on the input of the flip-flop, known as D, is saved and output on the Q signal. Between clock pulses, the flip-flop holds a value constant. This is critically important for creating robust circuits. Without diving too deep into the nitty gritty, let's use the clock and some DFFs to create a counter. In Lucid, you can use square brackets to create an array of something. This is basically just duplicating whatever you're making an array out of. So if we need an array of 27 DFFs, we are instantiating 27 individual DFFs in the circuit. We can use the DFF keyword followed by the name of our DFF and the size of the array to declare it. Notice that I put the declaration inside the clock connection block. This block is shorthand for hooking up a bunch of similarly named signals. The first CLK in the notation is the name of the port to connect, and the second CLK is the name of the signal. We could have also moved it outside of the block and hooked the clock line up directly, just like this. Now that we have a DFF to use, we can access its D and Q ports with the dot notation. We want to simply add one to it each time the clock rises, so we can assign its input D the value of Q plus one. This means that each time the clock rises, D will be copied to Q, and since D is always Q plus one, Q will increment each time. Since we declared the DFF in this array of 27, it will behave like a 27-bit binary number that we can use directly like this. We can also grab individual bits out of it. A 27-bit array has indices from zero to 26. We can hook up the most significant bit, AKA bit 26, to the LED like this. We can now build the project and load it onto the board. You should see the LED blinking very roughly around once per second. But how fast is it actually blinking? Well, a 27-bit number has two to the 27th combinations, or 134,217,728, and the clock has a frequency of 100 megahertz, meaning that it toggles at 100 million times a second, so the counter will overflow every 1.34 seconds. We can change the number of bits in the counter to change how fast the LED blinks. Adding a bit, will make it blink at half the rate, while removing a bit will make it blink at twice the rate. To recap, when working with an FPGA, everything we design simply exists in hardware and can work independently from each other. We can use combinational logic to perform calculations and control logic, and sequential logic, aka flip-flops, to control the timing and flow of data through our designs. FPGA designs generally consist of chunks of combinational logic connected through flip-flops. This paradigm is important to maintain so that the tools can properly lay out our design so that it meets timing constraints. Exactly what this means will be covered in a future video. That's it for now. I hope this video has helped you build a basic understanding of working with an FPGA. Leave us a like to let us know you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more tutorials like this one. As always, thanks for watching.